So what I most like about our context sensitive mechanism in BureauWorks or BureauWorks AI, whatever you want to call it, is that we're trying to humanize the process. We're trying to emulate what a translator would do and stick around, I'll explain exactly how this works. And we'll get into a great discussion of what AI translations look like and all of the different possibilities out there. When most people talk about AI translations, most people are thinking about machine translation done by a large language model, right? So machine translation, something like Google neural machine translation or like Microsoft neural machine translation, something that has been around the block. But now that same machine translation is being done by a large language model and it's better. Right? When most people I know talk about AI translation, they're thinking about large language models doing the machine translation work. When we began our journey towards large language models, and this was back in 2018, when we began that journey, we hypothesized that it would have been better to use large language models for inferential capabilities rather than for translation capabilities. As models continue to evolve, particularly with the breakthrough of GPT-3, we really stressed that hypothesis and we confirmed it to be true. Even though GPT was really powerful as a translation mechanism, we found that it had more power used elsewhere, right? So that's a little bit of the background. So when we think about AI translation, we're thinking about how do we create a scenario where we can really benefit from all of this knowledge so that the author, the person who's sitting in, 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 in the con control deck, how do we make that person feel more empowered, feel more control? And that's another very important bifurcation in this AI paradigm. There are basically two different routes that company takes takes. Uh, some companies are focusing on creating AI ready content. So for instance, it goes the same way it gets processed through a machine translation engine and gets consumed by an end user. Now it can, gets processed by a large language model consumed by an end user. We can do that in BureauWorks, but our niche, our focus is in the wealth of the interactions between the author and the text. So we're focusing, and I, I really dislike the term human in the loop, but we're focusing on that human who's in control, right? That human who's interacting with that text. The reason for that is that we still see in the years to come for many different reasons, for creative reasons, for compliance and legal reasons, we still see language as something that we want to belong specifically to people rather than to machines. So, all right, that's the background. When we talk about our approach in BureauWorks, we began thinking, okay, so what happens in language when a translator translates? So in, in a typical computer-assisted environment, so in, in what people call in our space a cat tool, a translator, they'll be in this environment where things are typically in the bi-column formats, they're looking at the source content, they're looking at the translations, and then they're looking at all of these windows with additional contexts that are fed to them. So they're looking at, for instance, things people call translation memories, which are past translations. And these past translations, they're ranked typically according to match level, sy syntactical match level. So for instance, John went to the store, has a different syntactical match level than John went to the supermarket, right? So it's pure syntax, comparing characters in one string versus characters in another string. Typically, the translator also will have access to some form of terminology base, a glossary, where they have their key terms, whether it's SEO terms or brand terms, they have those lists of terms. And then what typically happens is that the translator needs to go beyond that, right? The translator needs to perform what they call a concordance search, where they have to search, like, let's say, maybe they don't have, maybe they have like a 77% match for a given sentence, but they want to research. They want to make sure that that given term how has it been translated in another context? So they can search within the translation memory for bits and pieces of the content, and they can search in the glossaries as well for bits and pieces of the content. So what the translator is doing typically in these assisted environments is that they're looking at a suggestion, typically coming either from machine translation or from a translation memory, or even no suggestion at all, but they're looking at some suggestions coming from these different sources, typically, and they're making decisions. So they're making these different inferential decisions. They're saying, okay, in this case, the glossary says one thing, the transition memory says another thing, I'm gonna go ahead and go with the glossary. Maybe in this case, the transition memory feed is nearly there, but we're missing a few things that got updated. I will update that transition memory feed. All of that work, typically, typically, all of that initial legwork, linguistic legwork, isn't highly creative. Most of that linguistic legwork is about coherence. 
is about stability. It's about predictability. So, and even the, most of the quality frameworks that were produced around localization over the past 20, 40 years highly reward that, right? So for instance, terminological inconsistency is a big no-no. People, translators in LQAs or language quality assessments, they'll get flagged for those things and there'll be big errors. They'll get flagged for grammar errors. They'll get flagged for deviations in tone. They'll be flagged for deviations in meaning. They'll be flagged. So it's really the, the entire quality framework was built around correctness, let's say. So translators will work around this idea of correctness. So they're trying to look at all of this information and figure out what is the correct response? What is the most defensible response? What is something that I can stand by with? You know, what, why, what, if someone questions me, why did I make this decision? I want to have good responses, right? That's typically the mindset of a translator, particularly one that does well in this B2B environment. Now that kind of work, in our opinion, is actually well delegated to machines. Why? Because machines can make good inferences, or A, number one, they can search much quicker than the, any human can search, right? That's, I don't think that's up for debate. The, the, the length of time that it would take me to look up uh, a name or a sentence, you know, just the typing is going to take much longer than literally hundreds, if not thousands of search response interactions at the machine level. Number two, the machine can take into account much larger amounts of information at a time than I can. Maybe I can make more critical deliberations between one word and another, but the machine can consider maybe 30, 40 different terminology terms at the same time, lots of different references. So the machine will have, aided by large language models, obviously, the machine will have greater inferential capability or greater context windows than the ones I can work with. But that doesn't mean that the human isn't valuable. I would say quite the opposite. So in this scenario, our context sensitive is emulating that linguistic heavy lifting. It's looking, it's doing that ex exact same work that the translator would do. It's looking at the match. It's looking at the machine translation. It's looking at the glossary and it's making decisions. Hmm. Maybe in this case, I'm going to override that translation memory suggestion because the glossary is saying different and because the glossary is more recent or because there's a grammar mistake. So there, 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 there's a given rationale in how the large language model is processing that information. But the key distinction is that large language model isn't translating. The large language model is making an, arbitra an arbitration call. It's making a call on what it considers to be the most likely textual decision to be accepted by the translator with fewest amount of edits. And the translator is the recipient of this decision. They're reacting to this, and in their reaction, they're teaching the model. They're not changing anything. The model learns that whatever they're doing makes sense, and if they're, they are changing it, the model learns that whatever it's doing they, doesn't make sense. And when I say the model learns, let's qualify that a bit as well. So in our approach in BureauWorks, we're not training the model. We're training the RAG framework that feeds the model. What's the difference, you might ask? So when you train the model, you're working with a model that's stateful. A stateful model is remembering past responses and interactions, and it's using these interactions to produce responses for you. So typically, if you work with, for instance, Claude Sonnet 3.7, or if you work with GPT-4, 4.5, in most cases, you're working with a model, unless you disable it, you're working with a model that is stateful, that is remembering past interactions and is leveraging them to improve their responses, whether within the chat session or because you trained a specific model on something. Our approach is all about creating a window of context that's just perfect for the model to arbitrate from. So it's looking at a sentence, for instance, in English, and it's pulling within that linguistic corpus that a user is using in, in BureauWorks. It's getting that linguistic context and it's creating, assembling that context that's just the right size for the large language model to make a decision. The large language model makes a decision. When the translator reacts to that, what's getting trained isn't the model, it's the RAG framework. The beauty of that is that as models improve, as they evolve, we're not stuck to them. If tomorrow, for instance, we prefer to work with GPT 4.1 mini as opposed to 4.0, we can switch seamlessly. If tomorrow we decide to enable certain functions to operate using Claude Sonnet 3.7 as opposed to GPT 4.0, we can also switch seamlessly. From a security perspective, that's very important as well because we're not training on any customer data. We're not teaching any models. So we're not worried 
about adversarial attacks, about model poisoning, about a ton of other security concerns that ramify from training models. So our approach is, in our opinion, a very humanized approach. It's about empowering the language author, the translator, as someone who's very central and pivotal to this translation process. The challenge with our approach is that we're nudging, not just gently, we're very, <laughs> we're very compellingly nudging the translator to change their role. Because now all of that linguistic legwork is gone, and what's left is a much more refined, critical analysis of the translation suggestions. So the role shifts from being a translator to being a editor. And what's interesting is when I talk to translators, they often dislike the idea of being an editor. Translators like the idea of the art, the craft of finding just the right word, of researching. And I understand that it can be a little bit overwhelming, disorienting to let go of that piece. But the piece that's left, in my opinion, is actually a much higher value added piece. It's a piece that will ultimately enhance the perception of value that the trade as a whole has. And it's a piece also that will, in my opinion, also allow translators to flourish a lot more through their careers because now they're not just doing that grunt work. They're working at a level where they're crafting the, the, deci the decisions that were made so that they match their goals for that text. Similarly to like a newspaper, for instance, the newspaper editor is typically of a lot more importance from a hierarchical and often pay perspective than the journalists. Why? Because the editor, they're responsible for the newspaper as a whole. They're responsible for maintaining the tone, editorial integrity, etc., etc. And that's our perspective around what we're doing in Bureau Works. And I know that a lot of people criticize the idea of using AI to enhance, augment, whatever word you want to use, the translation process itself. But in my particular opinion, there are no really good options here. If you're, let's say, a, a resistant, a resistor. One option is to deny it completely, and good luck with that. I mean, I think you can find niches where you can deny that completely and continue to operate for the next maybe 5, 10, 20 years. It's, it's possible. I think that's for a very small minority of people who found a very specific niche that's completely immune to the digital, technical, technological transformation that's taking place in the world. The other option is to go full on machine, which is the option that we're trying to avoid. And the only way we can avoid that option is by building a middle ground that is actually economically feasible. What does that middle ground look like? Well, that middle ground has to be of much higher productivity, higher quality and lower cost. The way we do that is by by mitigating the level of effort required to get there. And we mitigate that by emulating that basic, more simple translation work to the large language model so that translators can make the more complex decisions that are the things that typically, at least most translators that I know, really love doing and in the first place. They may have forgotten that they love doing, but so many translators that I've known loved critical theory, loved going into literary analysis, loved dis dissecting and understanding exactly why they were taking one path over another path and what the best choice of words would be for that given scenario. And I think in that, in that context, what's really hard is finding a balance between good enough and someone that f something that feels truly yours. And I think this is super interesting because this whole challenge or conundrum is happening, in my opinion, in every single field, whether it's legal, whether it's copywriting, whether it's compliance. When you're working with models, it's very hard to find that balance where you're using a model, but you're still ensuring ownership over that content, right? And it requires so much presence of mind. It requires so much purpose. It requires so much clarity to be able to look at a piece of content and say, okay, this looks good, but this isn't what I would say. This isn't the way I would say it. And maybe that's fine in a given use case, and, and maybe that's not fine. Maybe that does require my intervention. Knowing when and how to intervene, in my opinion, is a direct reflection of level of wisdom and expertise, right? And it's the same idea in, in life, not to get too philosophical about it, but I think people who know when and how to intervene are typically, in my opinion, I regard them as pretty wise. You know, someone who's less wise is more likely to, for instance, get into silly arguments with people that are necessary or more likely to over intervene or under intervene. It's just, it's hard. It's like raising kids, right? Knowing which fights to pick, knowing when to take a stand. These aren't, aren't easy decisions. And in my opinion, for many of these, I don't even know if there's necessarily a categorical right and wrong. 
I think that there are journeys and experiences. And I think we're moving on into a different arena or sphere or space of human intellect, which is harder to operate in. It's less clear cut. And it's more about being finding a place where at least at the end of the day, you feel like you produce something that is meaningful, that is yours, and at the same time is commensurate with the immense technological potential that has been unleashed. Those are my thoughts. Would love to hear yours. Thank you so much for listening. Please leave your comments below. Thanks so much. Till next time. Bye-bye.